You are not the first to pass this way, nor shall you be the last. Those who seek the story of Maelstrom face peril and adventure, but more often find trolls and nostalgia for a non-IP Epcot. Welcome to Party of Two. I am one of your hosts, Andrea Donica. And I am your other host, the Internet's Mark B. Donica. And today we are going to travel back in time to revisit an old Epcot favorite in a episode of Inanimatronics. Inanimatronics? Inanimatronics. Maelstrom. That was part of the Epcot World Showcase Pavilion and was eventually replaced with what we have today known as Frozen Ever After. Triggered. Everyone's going to be triggered by this episode. I am very excited to talk about this. Being a Scandinavian background person myself, I had a lot invested in finding out about this attraction. I never actually got to ride it. Neither did Mark. Nope. But we did get to experience Frozen Ever After. And of course, we watch a bunch of YouTube videos and different things, just trying to get a sense for it. Back long before we were ever even talking about flying over to Florida, of course, I, I found out that there was a Scandinavian type of attraction that had trolls in it, which is very much a part of the folklore. And that I found was really exciting. And I remember seeing a picture in some sort of Disney book that I had. And it talked about how this boat ride went backwards down a waterfall. And I was like, whoa, that sounds amazing. I gotta check this out. And uh, couldn't find a ton of information at the time. But of course, you know, more stuff comes up eventually i i would never try to spoil attractions for myself it's something that i still kind of avoid doing if i know that i'm going to do something hopefully in the foreseeable future but when something's gone it's gone and or if something's in a very far away country and that particular <laughs> theme park is yeah. low on our list of stuff to hit then maybe we watch the Shrek Dark Ride or the Smurfs Dark Ride. <laughs> and we'll forget about it anyways, except if it was really bad. Yeah. <laughs> if we hear how it's like, okay, how bad is this? And we check that out. But I, had a, I didn't, I can't say that I had a similar experience. Like Disneyland was such a, it was sort of my whole world when it came to Disney parks Growing up, I was like, yeah, I, I hear that there's like a Disney World, but I don't know anything about it. I associated the um, Spaceship Earth as, as Disney World. Like I didn't know, oh, it's oh, it's just like Disneyland and that's a completely different thing. So I, I didn't really know a lot about Epcot until we started going out and and seeing when our romance was blossoming <laughs> and so i i knew next to nothing about this ride until closer to my adult life even though this opened the year i was born i uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that that's that's ultimately it it wasn't really until the it was really finding out that it was being replaced with frozen ever after did i start to go oh well what what's it replacing what's this thing and then like even in researching for this particular episode the majority of the scuttlebutt press reviews whatever you want to call it is so negative yeah and it's hard it, because we're seeing it happen at a lot of parks where I'd say primarily Disney, where a lot of their stuff that came from an original creative place is being replaced with IP based stuff. But that's sort of what we talked about in our wonders of life pavilion episode where like sponsorships and companies, that model is gone. It's gone. It, it's not reliable. It's not and successful. Something that we're going to talk about a lot today is whoever is paying for something they have certain expectations and they're going to have control over some of the decisions 
And as a result, you might not get the best of what Imagineering can actually do in terms of telling a story. Of course, it's always wonderful to have something that's completely original, uh, not always tied to an intellectual property, but the money has to be generated from somewhere. And if you can't rely on a company or a government to back everything, and this is the biggest problem with World Showcase, the idea was that all of these governments were going to be constantly funding for their own country for a 365-day-a-year World's Fair, and it didn't, it didn't happen. And maybe some governments are interested in doing it, but it was an overly idealistic approach to a theme park. And there are always great ideas in theory about how to run something really big. And the problem is having the faith and expectation that the people coming into it are going to meet your expectations and they don't always do. And when it came to the when it came to Norway supporting this pavilion, there were there so there's two stories. There are two two there were two versions of Maelstrom. There was the the original version that the Imagineers came up with, which was high fantasy, you're traveling through the realm of the Vikings and there's trolls and it's this big fantastical thing that sounds awesome yeah trying to find the the bridge to valhalla how flipping cool is that i mean it it sounds absolutely amazing and we don't have a ton of concept art and info to go off of joe Rody, this was actually one of his first major projects and he did the concept art for this attraction and he they they were going heavy on the trolls and there were going to be gnomes just the loading area itself you were going to be in the thick of a forest with these majestic mountains behind you it was going to be really spectacular and then the businesses that came in they were like oh well we like the there, you're going to be riding on Viking ships and that it's going to go backwards down a waterfall. That's really cool. But we, we kind of want something a little more engaging the public to come visit Norway. They, they wanted a, a tourism ride, a tourism, not a tourism video like was so popular back in the day. Like Cleveland has a good one. That's a joke. But they, they wanted something that wasn't what they didn't what what they wanted didn't work with disney and that showed one of the inherent flaws with the the country sponsorship model with the um the what what's the the, the financial backer model is in more cases than not it's the company's final say or the country's final say of what happens of what goes of so so as a result of the original vision of Epcot, which is wasn't a bad idea, still no. isn't a bad idea, and still and, and, plenty of love for it. And World Showcase, the the thing that Disney has sort of um, gone to now, it's more of using or utilizing these cult, utilizing these cultures to appeal to the various regions of the world to shine light on this particular culture or and and with that comes all the business opportunities of um, like like you said being of scandinavian descent seeing stuff that you grew up with on the big screen whether it was in frozen even though they said glug wrong uh, <laughs> that or or with the the christmas special or yeah. with any of that stuff they're providing those experiences for more cultures and with this it provide like they they didn't just sort of offhandedly choose that frozen happened in norway specifically 
Like it was supposed to be an amalgamation of a lot of different Scandinavian countries, but it was Norway on purpose because this Frozen wasn't just a good idea for a, a, a movie and fulfilling something that Walt had wanted from from back when he was still developing uh, movies, but this Frozen was so many things. Yeah, and to add the little salt bay on top of this is something that we can use to revitalize the Norway pavilion, I think was an amazing opportunity that they, they decided to make for themselves with this movie. And that's so not to say that the maelstrom that we got was a bad ride. No, not at all. Or a bad experience, but it, the, the, the Epcot model and the country sponsorship model took away from how good that ride could have been. Where if, it was Norway just funding the development of this amazing creative ride that the Imagineers had developed. We, it probably would have been a lot more of a conversation to replace Maelstrom with Frozen Ever After. I don't think it would have even something that would have ended up being touched. It would have been an add-on. The Sherman brothers had even drafted up a theme for the entire attraction Though it was just days after that the Norwegian backers flew in and basically Imagineering realized that they needed to go back to the drawing board. And apparently, rumor has it, there's a demo out there somewhere. I would really love to hear it. I would love to see more stuff. If anyone is listening to this podcast and has any sort of access, any sort of pictures that they might be able to share, please uh, pop us a message on Twitter, through our email at party of two pod at gmail.com and twitter at the same place we would love to see that and potentially share it with all of you if if you're interested as well i i think that i mean no matter what imagineering is always going to be limited by somebody right and it's always going to be the people that are paying for it and it makes sense you know we we dream big and then The money has to bring us back to reality, which is unfortunate. But we did still get a pretty cool ride with Maelstrom. And uh, we're going to dive into that right now. But first, we need to go back to before it was called Maelstrom. It was originally going to be called Sea Venture. And after the Norway backers saw what Imagineering was doing... They were actually kind of specific, but random with telling the Imagineers what they wanted. They threw out nouns like oil rig and polar bears and maybe a troll or two. They they were very strange in the things that they said that they wanted. And the Imagineers kind of sat back after they laughed, scratching their heads going, oh, how, how are we going to throw in all of these random things? It's just kind of all over the place. One of them came up with a very loose idea about time travel, going through Odin's eye as he was narrating the attraction so that you would actually go back in time and then go back forward in time with the magic with the trolls, etc. I find it really fascinating. Um, and I'm I'm also I'm I'm partially glad that Maelstrom is gone because I'm I'm not all about um, the oil industry, etc. And the whole oil rig as being the the grand finale was I think especially bizarre, the attraction does feel very disjointed. It's fun, but it's random because you start out seeing the Vikings and what they're doing, and then suddenly you end up in troll territory. You have that really cool moment where you go backwards down a waterfall and then you go forwards down another one, and it's just a lot of randomness, and then suddenly... You're in the North Sea, and it's supposed to be 
as originally conceptualized a really dramatic final scene, this was being marketed as Epcot's first real thrilling attraction. And you can actually see in promotional footage of guests riding the attraction, and they're all wearing ponchos. There were sprinklers to simulate rain. There was huge waves, and there were gusts of wind being flown, and there was supposed to be a gigantic Tesla coil making an incredible amount of simulated lightning. Eventually, Disney must have realized that soaking people with all of those water effects and having real simulated lightning in the same small well, it's area... Still, it's still electricity. It, it's dangerous. It, it's not a good cool, idea. Cool idea, even, no matter how much protection you put around it, even if you covered it in plexi or whatever. I wish they had at least tried that, but I think they were in too deep by that point. The opening of the attraction ended up being delayed by like two months. Or they said they would open it summer of 1988. The entire rest of the pavilion opened in May of 1988. It was the soft opening, right? Yeah. Because they like the attra- uh, the attraction wasn't open, but the restaurants and the shops were. Yeah, because the the they had the dedication ceremony in June with the Prince of Norway dedicating everything, and the ride wasn't open then. And then July, it ended it's up funny too up. because he he wishes Disney the best of luck. And in hindsight, now I'm like, oh, he's just wishing them luck to get the ride open. For the love of God, get this open. <laughs> but but he said, I hope, ultimately, he was like, I hope this works to get people interested in Norway and tourism, which it did. It but, did by a lot. Like, part of, the, part of the reason this ride feels so disjointed is because the Imagineers wanted this particular message and they only got half of theirs and the country only wanted a certain message but they only got half of theirs and it was there was no there really wasn't a through line there there was there wasn't a cohesive story there was a series of scenes but that doesn't necessarily give you a story and it's not it's not a collection of scenes in the same way i would say as haunted mansion has a collection of scenes because you still kind of feel like you're in one singular experience and that might be because you're in like one house but i feel like with maelstrom you're just you're you're in a lot of random places at a lot of random different times though i adore the puffins i adore the polar bears puffins were solid i mean the smaller the figure the less articulation it needs so yeah those those were gonna win the I don't know, man. Like, there, there's a lot of fun kitschiness that I, I wonder. I, I kind of wonder where the nostalgia comes from because there isn't necessarily there isn't a song. There, it's not like Journey into the Imagination, where you have that iconic Sherman Brothers song, and it. So, I don't know where the nostalgia comes from, other than hey, this is something I did as a kid. Like well, I, and sometimes that's enough for a person. I know that one of the figures that we heard from research was it was the most it was the most a smoke machine had been used in an attraction, right? Before, yeah. Like in the trolls scenes, but I I'm I really I legitimately want to know. I'm not attacking you. I'm not doing. I'm not trying to spark a reaction. But even haven't haven't been on that ride. But what is it about Maelstrom specifically? Because you go, oh, it's a classic. That does that doesn't say. But anything. But it's not like on Pirates of the Caribbean level. No, but I think... it feels like it could have been. But I think the fact that they had to split up the entire experience between the ride and then the seventy millimeter film that you entered into from the fishing village. That was another thing that randomly the Norwegian business people said that they wanted to see. 
Like, literally, they specifically said these things and Imagineering forced it as much as they could into this entire experience. Like a check, like checking things off. Well, even more so, like the, the albeit very beautiful oh, mural. Sure. Oh, I love the mural. It's an amazing mural, but it doesn't, it sets up a completely different idea for what the ride is. You've got some elements of Vikings on it. You've got some elements of the, the modern fisher and, and people who work in, in the water, whether it be um, there's, there's like a cruise director next to a cruise ship. You see the, a couple of oil rigs. So it it's presenting kind like eh? i mean technically the mural shows you everything that you're gonna kind of experience but it doesn't that like but it's still it's still disjointed because it's it's almost like something you would expect to see in a norwegian museum perhaps oh 100 i'd be which I'd is be cool surprised if it's not in some sort of a museum in norway because it's a beautiful work of art yeah i wonder if they ever sold it like not the the actual mural, but like copies of it. I'd be probably. Hard, I'd be hard pressed to find if they didn't. But it it's such an I don't I don't I don't get it. <laughs> not to say that it's it's not a good idea and that the ride wouldn't be fun. Like again, I'm not attacking anybody who enjoys this ride, but I'm also I also just don't understand where the hate comes from because. Norway pulled out of sponsorship once the tourism numbers were starting to sort of dwindle. Yeah, and actually something really interesting about that, from the first year after the attraction opened in 1988, while tourism skyrocketed for Norway, the businesses that actually helped fund the entire pavilion didn't really see a return, so they backed out. But then the Norwegian government stepped in and said, hey we'll we'll give you so much money to keep and maintain it so they they showed disney generally how much they appreciated the uh the fruits of their labor Mm. but you know once they back out as is the story with so many other epcot attractions anything with some sort of a sponsorship things start to kind of fall by the wayside Mm. Though Maelstrom was was still pretty decently intact, I mean, I don't, I don't hear a lot of things having gone through poor maintenance, for example, for the attraction. Maybe a slightly less articulation from some of the audio animatronics, mm. but those were kind of limited from the beginning. So I guess that didn't hinder it so much either which is helpful but then frozen comes out in 2013 and it becomes a cultural phenomenon Mm -hmm. and disney steps back and says well shoot people are going crazy over this they did a meet and greet in the area with Elsa and Anna, and the wait times for it ended up being like four or five hours long every single day. And they realized right away, we should probably capitalize on this as best we can. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. I don't think it was never in the conversation. Yeah. I thought that it was like they don't. Back in the day when you heard there were the rumors of Treasure Planet replacing the submarines or Atlantis replacing the submarines and then the movie's not doing well. I don't think that Disney makes movies specifically like, okay, and then we can incorporate in the theme park this way. But I highly doubt that Frozen was wasn't placed in a in a arena because once once frozen was successful let alone a phenomenon we got the uh disney adventure club or vacation club started having trips to norway yeah and you saw you went to see a lot of the stuff that the animators saw that got they got inspired for i i i don't it's not that disney didn't know if they were going to make a frozen attraction it was 
confirming their pipeline of when to start construction. And that's why that's when they eventually went public with well, it. Well, they they kind of jumped on it really fast. This is actually one of the rare instances, incredibly rare instances, where we actually see an attraction for an intellectual property make its way into the, any of the parks really quickly. If you look at Little Mermaid, for example, I mean... <laughs> it, was like two, it was like two, three years, right? <laughs> decades well, upon there, decades there was the there they had the proposal for the little mermaid yeah it was years. going it was going to go into disneyland paris and tony baxter had a really beautiful concept drafted up It'll be something we can probably talk about in the future i'm sure when we talk about that that ride um but for frozen frozen opened in november of 2013 and then october of 2014 is when they said, okay, we're closing Maelstrom. That was when they closed Maelstrom. They announced it in of the month before, yeah. which I think that was the other thing, too, that upset fans a lot, is they really only had a month to go visit the attraction and say their goodbyes. So so think about, think about that, too. From a business perspective, if they're locals, they go right away. If they're not locals... And somehow Maelstrom has touched their lives that much or they moved away or whatever you want to refer to it. Then you have 30 days to visit Epcot. And that means if you you really have to compartmentalize. So so let's say this, this is a huge far fetched sort of a situation. So so let's say for whatever reason we move out of state, you and I, Andrea and Mark the Donicus, for whatever reason we move out of state and we're comfortable wherever we are blah 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 whatever and we, having w- withdrawals sure but you hear that disneyland is going for whatever reason is going to close splash mountain oh, man. this is a hypothetical yeah how soon and, I, and this is specifically a situation for andrea because <laughs> i know how much splash mountain is important to her um how do you Go ah well, there's also there's the one here. There's there's this or the, rather they're closing Splash Mountain at all parks. So let's let's put it that oh. way. Like they're just getting rid of Splash Mountain because the the um, sun... maybe they're rolling out a completely different overlay and redo of the ride at every single. So the spot. Cl- the classic's gonna go. Do you travel to one of the parks to see it? I would definitely want to. How soon would you go? Like I gotta find flights right now. I gotta, I gotta. I'll wait till the very last week, the very last week, so I could just spend an entire weekend going on Splash Mountain. Like either way, Disney created a situation where from let me get the dates here. Boop, 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 boop. From September twelfth to October fifth, you have a mad dash of people running to Epcot. So that period had to have been a huge bump for tickets to Epcot, whether whether they like it or not. That's true. I I actually vaguely remember hearing something like that as well. Or this happens actually when any sort of attraction that's been a fan favorite is going to close, the ticket sales go up. Mm-hmm. It it double benefits them because they know that people are going to come out in droves to see the new attraction, but they also get to capitalize on the original closing as well. We saw that majorly with Jurassic Park not too long ago. Yeah. Well, like at the same time, I don't think it was as strong because it's still a Jurassic franchise ride, whereas this was a complete shift from Maelstrom to... A completely different IP, so to speak. So Disney got a lot from that last month for the Maelstrom fans, and at least you got a- an opportunity. At least it wasn't a thing where they closed the ride Eek. and the ride stayed. Yeah, they closed the ride, the ride stayed closed, and they went, "Oh, by the way, we're making something new with it." And so at least people got time. Yeah. So that's one thing. And the second thing being that I don't know if the if Frozen Ever After has had a short line in no, four years never it never has and i don't think it will as long as the frozen franchise continues 
I'd say even after that, maybe 10 years later, that ride will probably start to slow up. Maybe. Yeah. And even then, the kids kids that grew up with the franchise are going to start thinking that it's not cool. (laughs) So it's, I'm not saying like going to no wait, but I'm just saying going from the top waited for attraction in Epcot all day to maybe number two. Well, and it's going to help too once Guardians of the Galaxy opens up mm-hmm. with all the expansion things that they plan for Epcot. Eventually, the crowding will disperse in some way. But the Princess fans, they're still going to line up like crazy. Those four to five hour waits, as long as as long as it's still relevant. As long as it's still popular, it's going to be crazy. And the other thing that I've been thinking about, too, now that Frozen 2 is coming out this year. What? We just had that really cool teaser trailer drop not too long ago. What? Synergy? (laughs) Is that why we're doing a Maelstrom episode? I'm wondering if, if Disney is even on the side, or at least... I know that in terms of Imagineering, they will have teams kind of grouped together to just have some attraction ideas planned when a film is coming out. They're not necessarily going to go through with it, but if a film does really well, they have a couple of different projects that immediately the higher-ups can take a look at to potentially approve so that they can fully jump on that train and market it Hmm. and profit from it and i'm wondering if there's already some people at imagineering that are planning on integrating frozen 2 in some way into frozen ever after there's a very easy place you you do it in the final scene yeah you can can make that anything because it's just anna nelsa standing there with and they're technically wearing their frozen fever outfits yeah and so you can but either way you could change the outfit yeah um so there's there's definitely a way to integrate frozen 2 if if you need to because i don't know if anything can beat let it go as a modern disney ballad no nothing they put because disney puts it in everything if if there's any sort of multi-movie marketing that they do it's in everything it's in the the bloody um get your get your ears on the 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 mickey birthday show for some Mm. reason it's like it's park centered and there's some Mm. like the mickey mouse march and then of all sudden let it go you gotta get the kids excited so it's 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 gonna make them it's the new it's the new under the sea because under the sea is in every parade every show that's true every, almost everything i'll say <laughs> but but just about everything so it was there anything more about maelstrom that we wanted to hit before we talk more controversially about frozen ever after the queue is really dull i'm going to say i i was a little shocked re-watching one of the videos or multiple i should admit just yellow and blue and a bunch of flags. And I was like, "Oh, that that's it then." I was going to say also the their music. Like without the, the Disney parks have music. Yeah. Rides have themes. Whether it's something with a heavy story or not, it doesn't necessarily need a soundtrack, but even uh the Grand Fiesta Tour even before then there's still mariachi music that you could play it doesn't necessarily have to be the three caballeros theme because that plays at the end but the the as you're entering as you're on the boat going through and entering the first pyramid there's something you're hearing something from the pavilion that yeah. is playing whereas maelstrom i don't know if it was due to them just trying to appease norway but they didn't not even having like an instrumental yeah. of what the, sh- the the bros were working on. Because even just the, the split second of Frozen Ever After's uh, cue music, it was just a little bit of Love is an Open Door that was yeah. played in sort of a more traditional uh, style. And it, it's nice. It's it, because it, you you're immediately brought into that place. Yeah. The the music brings you into the world. The the song itself brings you into the world of Frozen. But the style makes you go. This is something new. This is something different. And I'm I'm excited for it now. When you're sitting in that queue for two hours 
and the and you notice yeah. the loop going again it can be a little frustrating but other than that it's still <laughs> like the, you. i think that cue is a lot of fun no it is but it's it's any cue being like oh sure for, for radiator springs racers when we were there for opening week <laughs> and just hearing that half an hour loop like six <laughs> times <laughs> it was so how many, bad how many uh like very very old songs about cars could disney pull a surprisingly few amount and some of them really aren't exactly Good. tied to cars at all daddy's little fatty what is it I... no no that's that's a, that's a euphem- that's a euphemism to a particular model of car oh because it sounds like he's just singing about his son and how he's like a, a roly poly yeah that's what it is the it sounds like he's singing about how his so- his son is like a little fatty that he just loves to roll look around at, look at my little fat son i love my little fat <laughs> son so weird i roll my little fat son around i don't well no but but yeah the maelstrom it's one of those it feels like one of those things that you have to have grown up with because if we had been a part of the final rides and gone on i don't know if we would have like liked it ultimately like when we were when we were there when we when we visited epcot was a strange experience exciting for us but strange we were we i liked stuff that i didn't think i'd like i didn't like stuff that i thought i would like it was so interesting and bizarre of the like what are what is like spaceship earth like that's a that's a monument and and i hear i'm using the word a classic and it's held to such a high regard but us seeing it in the condition that it was in yeah it as a, with a fresh pair of eyes was just like we don't get it like that i appreciated it but it, it was also it made me a, a little sad it was horribly outdated and i'm i'm happy now that it's getting the care that it deserves yeah so that it can they're not pulling a journey into imagination they are updating and maintaining so that the technology matches and every everything feels like it makes sense so that that i'm is i think the right thing to do it's hard to for a ride that had really really short wait times and was was a really quick walk on and they didn't have the budget to completely overhaul it and they had this fresh new thing that everybody was loving you if i'm in that boardroom there's no way i'm not saying we yes make it a frozen ride there's no way i'm not saying and i'm I'm quite sure there were guests that were asking for it too in comments and responses. Frozen is a monolithic train and it is not stopping. It it is going full speed ahead. It it's a bullet train. That's what it is. Mm. And you you got to Get on it or get out of the way. I, I'm sorry to say, but I understand parents being irritated hearing let it go over and over and over again. I get it. Kids will latch on to something and they will repeat it. But it's not the entertainer's fault that something is made really well. If it wasn't let it go... I'm sorry to say, parents, it was going to be something else. It was going to be, do you want to build a snowman? Yeah. If it wasn't going to be, do you want to build a snowman? Love is an open door. Even then, but... The whole soundtrack is good. Like, you just... You you, you got to deal with it. That It's just what it is. It's a well-made movie, and I think the reason that people don't like it is because it's good, and be and the They parents, don't like that it's popular. That's why people are irritated with it. And it's... Re- the, and it's for girls, and that's why people get so triggered over it. Like, and you know what? As a female, I I'm frustrated with that, and I'm just gonna come out and say it. You know what? Let us have our princess things. I am tired of constantly seeing a bunch of fanboys get so upset anytime there's some sort of female representation that takes precedence over something. Like just just back off, okay? Like. It's okay to like something just because it's not masculine. Get over it. I think there's also it's the 
I think it's one of my biggest problems with nostalgia and me being nostalgic myself, but I think I leave something a little bit open is people don't want to replace the things that brought them up. Yeah, which is understandable. And I don't think people were ready for this to be like this. This goes back and fits in with the just solid nature of Disney Renaissance stuff. And it 100% deserves to be put in the position that it's in. And while, yeah, I wish they would mix up certain things more times out of not their use the disney's use of this franchise in other media is very successful and um the best version of let it go was the opening season of a uh, world of color winter dreams yes I they agree. they had um but on that same note i've i've been playing through kingdom hearts 3 and we just finished through through arendelle and it it wasn't good <laughs> because the game, the, the one of the problems with the, the Disney worlds is now it's now that the, the developers presume that you've seen the movie. So they leave key scenes out so that you fill in. Oh, I know what happened because I saw the movie. So unfortunately it, it can tell incomplete stories. So the, and also the fact that, and, and I suppose this is still considered a spoiler because we're under a month from Kingdom Hearts being released. They put Let It Go in a video game. They put Let It Go in Kingdom Hearts 3. I have a screenshot of Goofy walking in a tundra <laughs> and Sora like, oh, what's that? Is that Elsa? Yeah, they're being really creepy. It's well, weird. It's, well, that's the thing. I mean, is, they, they do that with a lot of the characters, but some it's of the, just creepy. Some of the integrations of Sora, Donald, and Goofy don't work. <laughs> but like, then you, I, I took a step back. I love the Keyblade that you get from it because it looks like Elsa's castle. Um, yeah. The the heartless were interesting. You got those little like reindeer type guys, adorable, they, and they were kind of bouncing. Mm-hmm. Like they loved Elsa, which I thought was really cute. But the the idea that the 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 reason why Sora was drawn to Arendelle is because it's about a, a the healing a frozen heart and yeah. Kingdom Hearts all about the hearts. Um, so it's like taking a step back. It worked. It made sense. For some reason, you find a, gi- fight a giant wolf heartless at the end as opposed to like Hans. Though like they're... It's, it's a very interesting usage, but there was no doubt that Kingdom Hearts 3 is on the horizon. Frozen's going to be in it. So when the announcement finally came, everybody went, okay, cool. We, we knew because Frozen is everywhere. Yeah. And when it, came, when it comes to this ride, this ride is one of the best structural storytelling rides um if you if you want to call it one of the the new a new version of disney's classic dark ride this is one of the best ever the music flows so beautifully between scenes and it feels really seamless well constructed i have to say for the scene with Elsa where you go backwards. I I got chills. I mean, my hey. I got goosebumps. I I was like, oh, this was really cool. Just, it, I I don't know. It it, it was it, it was kind of transformative well, for it, me it, to experience that and be like surrounded in in her ice palace and. Another thing that, you know, I think Imagineering should be given credit for is we weren't just getting a rehashing of Frozen. This was a new story. Elsa is inviting everybody to come and have a Frozen day in the middle of summer uh, as a celebration for what happened it with was her the, sister. It was to commemorate the anniversary of the day that Anna saved her. Yeah. It was a sister versary. Which is really adorable. Oh my gosh. Oaken Oaken's little um It was it's the sauna. Yeah, you you end up in his sauna in, in his tavern 
going through the queue. I'm I'm jumping back and forth oh, right now, fine. but it's just really funny, and <laughs> I I don't know. I just also, I I the- like interactive cues, and that cue actually feels slightly interactive. You're not you're not necessarily touching anything. And I also like how they use the old fishing village sets from Maelstrom and just, you know, t- changing it up a little, little bit. Everything fits in comfortably because all of the architecture from Norway was used as an inspiration for Arendelle. Arendelle isn't technically Norway. Scandinavia as a whole inspired the design elements and setting of Frozen, but they they based the majority of it on Norway, particularly because of of the fjords. And I I think it goes together really well. And well, yes, also it, it gave the ride more time. Yeah, because they they have the same the area that they used to double load is now a or the, that they used to double unload is now a load and unload area so the part that was the queue or i'm sorry the the final queue for maelstrom is now more ride yeah so they made the ride and the experience longer and better and the Olaf animatronic is one of the best Amazing. animatronics in any so the all only- of the audio animatronics are incredible my jaw was like dropped to the floor when i saw olaf for the first time i i mean i don't know you probably weren't looking at me because we only got to go on that ride once and yeah, everything an was new <laughs> but i was so excited i and i mean olaf can great on on my nerves a little bit depending it's a polarizing and, character but not in this attraction i i found him completely adorable and just seeing his sparkly snowman self and and the different parts of his body swishing around and moving well that's that's the thing is this the way that they've perfected motion for this character is something that we're going to see in hashtag dad bell animatronic yeah when the beauty and the beast ride opens but coming into the whole show scene and it's got the the twinkling raindrops in the like that whole the, scene is yeah. amazing and i would i would put it akin of a similar feeling to when we saw sarge or no sheriff and mater yeah going like oh my god they did it. they're doing it how do they do it yeah i can't believe it and you get a singing dancing skating olaf right off the bat and my my few one of my only gripes with the ride is that they rely on the rear projecting animatronic on the rear projecting face screen Mm -hmm. which the animation is crisp and the but the coloring is always leaves something to be desired yeah and it's not as magical as like going back to to radiator springs the fact that it it makes sense that the mechanics of sheriff and mater have enough room and space for a moving mouth whereas with lightning they have to do the projection and that's not as that it takes you right back out so it's something for me where that adds to the programmability you can just reanimate something and put it on the face yeah but it it takes me out a little bit and even for uh the let it go scene it was it's cool but it's still also like you, the luckily for that scene your eyes are all over you're seeing Elsa's reflection on all of the the panels and so it's not and she's not that close she's far away so the lighting is presented in a certain thing but for like the in summer that i'm just like yeah i wish we had it. especially going from uh, that to Grand Fiesta Tour, where we've got three completely functional, I say functional, but com- completely non-screened caballeros that are that are singing. And it, as opposed to being on screens the rest of the time, it's sort <laughs> of like a reverse setup and payoff. Yeah. I understand why, yeah. but it, it takes me out a bit. 
That's fair. Yeah. Do you, do you like we're 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 de- taking a lot from Maelstrom, <laughs> but and and putting Frozen over really 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 a lot. Was there is there anything about Frozen Ever After that takes you out of the experience? I wish the snowies were more blinky <laughs> and animated. Instead of just head turning. There's like one or two where their heads turn. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of them are static. And I wish a few of them would have a little more movement. Sure. I, I love the little snowies. I think they're really cute. Having Marshmallow there, though, pulls the focus. So that's probably why they didn't do it. And I love how excited he is that he has all of his little baby siblings with him. That that tickled me pink, mm-hmm. truly. Mm-hmm. Um, anytime I see like a, a static figure that is just painted and I can tell that it's not going to move, that always disappoints me a little bit. Obviously, pretty much every attraction has something like that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't I don't hold it against the right at all. Screens for the faces. I 100% get where you're coming from. Mm. I feel like when you're actually on the ride, to me, it's not as glaringly obvious as long as the projection is actually maintained really well. Mm. Now we've seen the Buzz Lightyear audio animatronic in Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters. We've seen that projection not maintained in the past and once that fades it doesn't look so good so as long as that is maintained in person i think it looks really fantastic and i think that it's smart of them to do that when you record it with a camera or something it it's going to read a little bit differently so it's always going to feel a little strange when you're sitting there and watching your home videos or what someone's uploaded on YouTube because the lighting it never translates 100% the way that you experienced it while you were there. Sure. And that's why I I'd say the only one that I can remember vividly was that final scene, especially because you have this amazing Olaf animatronic mm. next to these two facially projected ones. And I hope that with the beauty and the beast uh, attraction that we're getting with hashtag dad bell animatronic though (laughs) that the all of the r&d that the country and the company are putting into that technology once that that r&d is done and paid for they can start applying it to other places and if ever after ever gets a frozen 2 touch up then that's a perfect opportunity to touch up the animatronics get some new heads yeah. And do whatever you want with it. Absolutely. I I understand why they did this. They needed to keep everything darker. Something that I wanted to say before when we were talking about Maelstrom was that that was actually the first audio animatronic dark ride that was painted in black light which I thought was really interesting. And that is something that I think reads really well in in the old videos that I was watching. It it really does have a a fun, luminous quality about it, which was really, really beautiful. Additionally, there's that really awesome waterfall that is uh, on the outside of the entrance to the attraction. And on Maelstrom, in your second encounter with a troll, you for a moment seemingly might go over that waterfall, you turn around, and then you go down into the North Sea. And you actually get a nice bright view to the outside because there's a little window looking in and was something really nice for just a visual feature for people approaching the pavilion as well. They needed to close it up for Frozen to keep things a little bit darker for the lighting for the snow geese and for Marshmallow because they're so they're so white Mm. (laughs) and they needed to um, darken things up, I imagine, to put more black light in there. So 
that's a little bit of a bummer of a loss. And anytime I look at the images, and I remember in person too, I could really tell that that rock work was newer than the rest of the rock work around it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you have certain trade-offs. But that's uh, that's pretty much all all that I can say for really being sad about the switch over. I love Frozen Ever After. It would have been really cool to experience Maelstrom in person. Thankfully, we've got all of these lovely documents on the internet. But before we go, Mark. Yes. Where can the folks find you online? Well, the last thing I wanted to say was now that we have VR and these 4D experiences, I think it's only a matter of time before those type of experiences become personalized in the home. And like we we have it with the original Star Tours, somebody can create and program the original Maelstrom ride. You put on a VR headset, you ride that ride. I think it'll be a matter of time before everybody can do that in the comfort of their homes or go to a place and do it. Or imagine Epcot or Disney Springs has a VR thing, not necessarily too far away from Disney Quest, but some sort of a thing where you can ride on these old attractions because they recreated them digitally and you could ride them in VR. So I think Maelstrom or any ride that or Journey into Imagination or whatever, I figure it's only a matter of time before Disney can offer those experiences which would be nice Mm -hmm. i will say though nothing ever beats the physicality of something actually being in front of you and i'm sure that the the vr experience can get close not truly replicated but it it can provide something for fans of history and who never wrote it or fans who want to share something that their family never got to write that's, True. that's all I have to say about that. But um, you can follow me at Mark B. Donica. You can support us by going to tpublic.com slash user slash party of two. We have three designs up right now and we're working on some more. So uh, go check out. We have cinnamon toast and tacos, por favor. No jumping high fives and Eckert lives, which is sort of a, a preview of an episode that I've been wanting to doing ever, ever since we started doing the show. And yeah, so go check those out. Support us there. Tell your friends. If you're a fan of theme parks and you go to theme parks with your friends, share the show with them uh, so that we can grow this this party. A little, a little bit more than a party of two here. Um, follow us on Twitter at Party of Two Pod. If you want us to do a show about a particular topic, email us at Party of Two Pod at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter. And we have recently gotten a Facebook page up and running. Yeah. So... Feel free to contact us there as well. Yes. Feel free to post up and start a little community of the Parks fans that are out there listening. And the last little promo thing I wanted to say, if you're listening to us on Not Anchor, uh, that's where our podcast lives. Anchor.fm slash Party of Two Pod. You can actually sign up for a monthly, a paid monthly subscription there. It's not mandatory, but if you want to help us out, it will go to fund all of our adventures. You can sign up for a dollar, four, uh, five dollars, or ten dollars a month. We would humbly appreciate it. But again, we just thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, and you can follow me, Andrea, on Twitter and on Instagram at Dole Whip Drea. Until next time, Parks fans. We'll see you on the next ride.